Welcome back to Geometry. Today we move on to Chapter 5. And like Chapter 4, it deals largely with triangles and relationships in and among triangles. Triangles are everywhere we look, and not just at Epcot. And they teach us a lot about practical matters of engineering, design, and, of course, mathematics. The first section of the chapter is titled Circumcenter and Orthocenter. We're going to talk about circumcenters today, and in the next lesson, we'll move on to orthocenters. Section 5.2 discusses two more center sounding things. Each of them is a piece of an answer to the question what is the center of a triangle? So today, circumcenters. For this lesson, you'll want to have your compass and straight edge handy, so take a moment to get those if you need to. One of the things we learned early in this course was the definition of a midpoint. If we're talking about a midpoint of a segment, it is the point that is equidistant from the two endpoints of the segment. But I left something out from that definition. It is the point on the segment that is equidistant from the two endpoints of the segment. There could be other points not on the segment that are also equidistant from the two endpoints. Here, the segment is AB, and the midpoint is M. But is M the only point equidistant from both A and B? I'd have to say no. It appears point P is equidistant from A and B, and so too is point Q. We could draw other points, too, if we wished, that are equidistant from both A and B. If all of those points were drawn, they would appear to form a line that appears to be the perpendicular bisector of segment AB. But is it? Because after all, we can't just make conclusions in geometry because a diagram looks a certain way. We have a theorem, however, and that theorem does allow us to draw this conclusion. Here's what it says. A point lies on the perpendicular bisector of a segment if and only if it is equidistant from its endpoints. Notice that the theorem contains the phrase if and only if. It's a biconditional. And since a biconditional can be written as two separate conditionals, we actually have a two-part proof here. Here are the two separate conditionals. On page 206 of your textbook, the second one is proved, the one that says if a point is equidistant from a segment's endpoints, then it lies on the perpendicular bisector of the segment. The first one is proved back in the exercise section on page 211. You're also reminded in your book of the notation. The biconditional, P if and only if Q, is shown with the arrow pointing both ways. The separate conditionals with the arrows going to the right are P implies Q and Q implies P. But having said all that, we're going to move right back to page 211 and complete the proof that we see in exercise number 17 of the exercise section that if a point lies on the perpendicular bisector of a segment, then it is equidistant from the endpoints. You'll notice that while the authors kindly provided a diagram and a given, the proof statement is left blank. What do you think the proof statement should be? In the statement of the theorem, it said, then it, the point, is equidistant from the endpoints. So if P is equidistant from A and B, the proof must be that AP equals BP. Remember that it's always vitally important when completing a proof to know what it is you're trying to prove. Let's look at the first three statements and reasons now. The first statement, as always, is the given. So let's put that in place right away. The second reason, combined with the diagram, should tip you off about the second statement, what was added to the original figure. It would appear that segments AP and BP were, so that provides us with our second statement. The third statement is that angles AMP and BMP are right angles. How do we know this? 
Notice the given that line K is the perpendicular bisector of segment AB. Therefore, the reason here is definition of perpendicular. The rest of the proof is going to closely resemble many of the proofs we did in chapter 4. Therefore, I want you to pause the video and finish this proof of number 17 on your own. Once you have filled in the missing statements and reasons, go ahead and resume the video and see if you got them all right. Did you get them all filled in? Let's take a look and see if you got them correct. All right, statement number four was that triangles AMP and BMP are right triangles. The reason for this is definition of right triangle because that's what they are, triangles with a right angle. Statement number five might not have been obvious at first, but statement number six provided a big hint. It is that M is the midpoint of segment AB. And once you know that one, reason number six is a lot easier. It's the definition of a midpoint. All right, so we come to number seven. And reason number seven should have been fairly easy. That one's the reflexive property. Statement number eight has the leg-leg theorem as its corresponding reason, so it would have to say something about two right triangles being congruent, and those tr are triangles AMP and BMP. The congruent segments in statement number nine are AP and BP, and the final reason is the definition of congruent segments. Now remember, that's just the first part of the theorem. The second part is what you see written out on page 206. We need the two parts because the theorem is stated as a biconditional. In the introduction to the lesson, in fact, in the title of the lesson, I mentioned that we were going to learn about circumcenters today. We're going to define that term in a minute, but first, let me demonstrate what is pictured at the top of page 207. I have here two congruent triangles cut from paper. One has been folded, the other is not. This one on the left was folded in such a way that a vertex lines up with another vertex. And this was done three different times like so, and that created the three folds. And notice, all three folds meet in a common point right here. Now the three folds each can be shown to be a perpendicular bisector of one of the three sides of the paper triangle. Where are we going with this? Well, it turns out that in any triangle, the three perpendicular bisectors will always be concurrent. They will always all intersect at one point, and we call that point the circumcenter. Here's the formal definition. The circumcenter is the intersection of a triangle's perpendicular bisectors. It is also worth noting that the circumcenter can sometimes be found in the interior of the triangle, sometimes in the exterior of the triangle, and in certain triangles, somewhere on the triangle itself. And since this is geometry, we can't just go and make such bold statements that things will always happen without a property or theorem to back them up. And we do indeed have such a theorem. It's called the Circumcenter Theorem, and it's found on page 207. Here's what it says. The perpendicular bisectors of the sides of a triangle are concurrent at the circumcenter. Notice that the circumcenter is equidistant from its vertices. In this diagram, point C is equally distant from X, Y, and Z. Now this theorem may seem like it's going to be big and tricky, especially with its given and prove, but it's actually a lot simpler than it seems. We're given triangle XYZ, and that lines K and M are perpendicular bisectors of just two of the sides. Lines K and M intersect at point C since they're coplanar and they're not parallel. Since point C is on line K, which is the perpendicular bisector of side XZ, point C is equidistant from X and Z, and that's why we can write that CX equals CZ. Since point C is also on line M for the same reason, we can write that CX equals CY. 
That's where statement 3 comes from. Statement 4 just applies the transitive property to state that CY equals CZ. And finally, statement 5 circles back and tells us that point C has to be on line N2 because of the fact that CY equals CZ. Both reason 3 and reason 5 are from the theorem on the previous page, one from the first part of it and one from the second. That theorem is related to a very interesting fact. If point C, the circumcenter, is equidistant from all three vertices of the triangle, and CX, CY, and CZ are all equal lengths, then there exists a circle that passes through X, Y, and Z with its center at C. This circle is called a circumscribed circle because it passes through all the vertices of the triangle. In fact, any circle that passes through all the vertices of a polygon is said to be circumscribed around that polygon. Here's that triangle with its circumcenter C and the circle circumscribed around the triangle. X, Y, and Z are both vertices of the triangle and points on the circle. The three sides of the triangle are all chords and segments CX, CY and CZ, if they were drawn here, would be radii of the circle. Every triangle has a circumcenter, and it could be outside the triangle, like the one you see on page 208, or inside the triangle, like the one that was just on the screen. Speaking of page 208, go ahead and turn there and get out your compass and straight edge, because today we are going to add another cool construction to our list. This one is constructing a circumscribed circle, or as I like to sometimes call it, a circumcircle. That's not an actual term in the book. It's just a word I like to use. Now you'll see here on my paper that I have an obtuse triangle. Okay, There it is, obtuse triangle. It's very similar looking to the one in the textbook. What I am going to construct is the circumscribed circle of this obtuse triangle. And to do that, I need to construct two perpendicular bisectors of two sides of the triangle. Now we know how to do that. Construction number four, back in chapter two, taught us that construction, and we're going to do it here twice. I'll start with the perpendicular bisector of side PQ, and then the perpendicular bisector of side QR. Now to make the first perpendicular bisector, and that's the one of PQ, I'm going to take my compass here, and I am going to, okay, well, I don't have to open it to any particular length, but I'm going to put the stylus on P, make an arc over here, and an arc over here, put the stylus on Q, and make arcs of the same radius. And there they are. I go ahead and connect them with a line or a segment. And I now have one perpendicular bisector of one side. I'm going to repeat the process with QR. Now there may be some overlapping in the drawing, so we'll just be careful to be accurate and neat. But I'm going to make an arc over here and an arc over here. Put the compass point on Q. I'm going to go left-handed here to impress all of my students who are left-handed. So make an arc there and an arc there. And I will once again connect them. So pencil point there. Get that straight edge lined up nice and straight. And there we have it. And finally, notice this intersection point right there. I'll draw it a little bigger to make it obvious for you. That is the circumcenter where the two perpendicular bisectors of the uh, two sides meet. Now, if I wished, I could also construct the perpendicular bisector of the third side, PR. But that's not actually necessary to do. It would make a nice check, though. And it certainly isn't wrong to do. Now at this point, we're done with the part of the section on circumcenters. And we're going to wrap up this lesson. Now for your assignment, I had to pick the questions about circumcenters apart from the questions about orthocenters, which you'll see 
next time, which is why you have a rather odd-looking collection of problems to do today. Now for questions 8 through 10, the instructions tell you to copy, draw, and to make a conjecture. Remember what a conjecture is, first of all. It's a conclusion based on inductive reasoning. So draw the perpendicular bisectors, then conjecture where the circumcenter will be located for that type of triangle. These three problems are related to numbers 23 through 25, where you need to actually make constructions of the circumscribed circle. A word to the wise, too, about constructions. Leave yourselves plenty of room on the paper. You don't get any bonus points for trying to cram three constructions onto half a sheet of paper, so don't try. Question 26 asks about the coordinates. Remember that what you know about coordinate geometry is going to help you here. Perpendicular bisectors involve midpoints, and we know how to find those. And they involve slopes, too. And we know something about perpendicular lines and their slopes. Those facts will help you. Okay, get out there and do a great job on your assignment, and we'll talk about orthocenters in our next lesson.